How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. Ever heard of a tree growing half as high as it could? No. No. That is impossible. A tree grows as high as it can, drives down every root, can produce every leaf. It's as far as it possibly can. Every life form extends to the max, except human beings. Now why not human beings? We're not robots. We're given the dignity of choice. And here's a couple of alternatives on the big choice to part of or all of. To have the you got the choice. Do a little to make yourself comfortable and forget the rest, or do it all. Do not doubt your own ability. Don't doubt your ability to change. Don't doubt your ability to grow. Don't doubt your ability to take command. Don't doubt your ability to learn all the skill. Whatever you want, I'm telling you it's all possible. Make this note. None of us lack the capacity. We have far more capacity than we have time to take advantage of. I do read a record where it says all that time ago, some people lived to be 700 years, 800 years, 900 years old. I feel a little short -changed. When I only had the chance maybe to live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. When all that time ago, the record says, some lived to be 700, 800, 900 years. It seems like it would take 7 or 8 or 900 years to tap the full extent of our capacity. Let alone 70, 80, 90, 100 years. But here's what I'm asking you to do. Get busy. You've got more brain power than you've used so far. You've got more potential than you've used so far. You've got more strength than you've possibly used so far. No telling how many languages you can learn. No telling how far you can go. No telling how strong you can get until you get busy working on yourself and see if you can't tap all of your full potential. Success is not something you pursue. Chase, run, act, test it. Develop. Trap. A whole machine unlock all the treasure. Whether it's economic treasures or spiritual treasures, financial, social, personal, every way you can possibly think of, is by your own personal. Then he added one more, which is important. It's probably worth the price of the Here it is. What you become, much more valuable. Um, more valuable. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here. The ask on the job is getting. Very important. Is what you become a track. Comes cynical. Track. Um, this whole subject of development. So, Vitally important. Change my You say, well, what can I do about the upcoming winters of my life? The challenges that I know I'm going to face. Here's what you can do. You can get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, and better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came with. Get stronger. You can develop the muscle. You can develop the courage muscle. You can develop the inspiration muscle. You can develop the dedication muscle. You can get stronger. There's anybody here that can't get stronger. Next time we see you, may not even recognize you. How strong you're going to be able to become in language, style, personality, the ability to cope, the ability to handle with anything that happens, no matter what happens. And the third one is get better. We can all get better. I've gotten better. First talk I gave, I stood up, my mind sat back down. But here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. I stood up and I did it again. And I did it again and I did it again all those many years ago. I did it when I was scared and I did it when I didn't want to and I did it when I was ill. And I did it when it didn't work well and I didn't did it when they didn't appreciate it. And I didn't a lot of times when I didn't know much what I was doing. I just did it anyway. And now, all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage. The greatest introduction I've ever had, greatest response and welcome I've ever had, 
The greatest opportunity I've ever had to touch this many lives with a mixture of words and heart and soul. I got better. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month and I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach. Until you can develop influence that won't quit. Touch people next year you couldn't touch this year. Touch people now you couldn't touch before. Conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before. Heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there missing before. I'm asking all of you to get better in spite of the winters, in spite of the downturn. The money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, whatever it is. Just get stronger. Get better. So we put some of the valuable things on the higher. So you can't get too into it. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you got to book here. You book your radio again. See, I learned those concepts. So unbelievable. There's something different than ever. The last. Something different, like the health. Relationship with the family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. Gold star building. Thing. Same circumstance. We cannot change the circumstance. Can change. Yeah. Then he gave me another secret. What you have at the moment, Mr. Owen, you've attracted by the person you've What you have at the moment, you've attracted. You little simple person, you understand me. Stop playing so much. Sometimes it's a little tough day blaming yourself. Taking responsibility instead of putting it off on some that transition. Times is a challenging mission. And this one was a little tough for me. Well, so here's the thing. Learn to work harder than yourself. I got that. Learn to work harder than Bob. If you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. You work hard on yourself. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard work. You'd have known me. You'd have said that. I'm the guy. I don't mind coming a little bit early. Lay, I don't mind that. But Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and up in the bank and behind all his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job. Not on my... So, I'm telling you, if you'll learn that... Start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you... And start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, so dynamic, just your income... And economics is the least of the values. Start earning in terms of equity. So start working harder on yourself than you caught on your young it. Like emotions coming more valuable to you know money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. Go to work on the right thing. Not get things out there to change. Don't try to change. No. So I all don't change the sunshine. Don't change rain. Don't change. That's the miracle of everything that's available. Work. Start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy. Work on your attitude. Work on your personality. Work on your language. Work on the gift of culture. Work on all of your abilities. You'll start making those personal changes. I'm telling you. Everything. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. Here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago, help take something around the world, so can you. If I can stand on this platform, Idaho Farm, lawyer raising obscurity, so can you. If the millionaire team can do it, president's team can do it, 
walk off with the diamonds, the trophy soaked in you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. Forget the thief in the alley that's after your purse. What about the thief in your mind that's after your prom? The thief in your mind that says you're too short. The thief in your mind that says you're too tall. The thief in your mind that says, well, yes, it'll happen to people out in California, but it can't happen way over here on this side of the world. I'm asking you to conquer that thief, even though you find him in your own conscience. I want to reassure you that you can do it. I want you to reassure you that you can make the decision. I want to reassure you that no matter what the night, no matter what the storm, no matter what the difficulty, there isn't anybody here that can't figure it out. Find some things to do, step at a time, yes. Minute at a time, yes. Day at a time, yes. Week at a time, yes. But there isn't anything you can't walk away from. There isn't any challenge you can't overcome. I want you to have that kind of belief in yourself. A person who has purpose in their life. They have something to go for. Some meaning. One writer described it. For some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distraction. distraction. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor lunch. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties, and things that come at you, you've got to have something on out there, beyond that, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year, that pulls you into the future. The clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. Get your mind working. How to achieve that purpose. If your mind will work and the heart works and the spirit works. And if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't do. That's one of the great powers that will make a variable of you, and that is purpose. I want you to ponder the four ways. Here's the first one, and that's why. Why pay the price? Why work this hard? Why go this far? Why try to learn this much? Why try to do it all? Why try to see it all? Why try to have it all? Why do it? Why learn it? Why study? Why put yourself out? Why try to take on this ability? Why develop yourself to pull? Why try to become all that you can become? Why try to earn as much as you can earn? Share as much as you can share? Develop every skill you can. See every human you possibly can. Go to every class you possibly can. Touch everybody you possibly can. Why do that much? Why go that far? Why share that much? Why give that much away? Why try to see everything? Why try to do everything? Why try to become everything? That's a good question, why? And you're the only one personally that can answer that question for yourself. You've got to have your own list of why. Work on your list of why. One of the big trusts for success to come up with a strong enough why. If the why is powerful, the how is easy. But if the why isn't strong, your goals aren't powerful. 
If the vision isn't clear, the old prophet said, without a vision we die, without a vision we perish, without a dream we're nothing. I'm asking you to sit down with your family and develop a dream strategy. I'm asking you to make a list of what, what you want, what kind of health do you want, what kind of skills do you want, what kind of income do you want, what kind of gifts do you wish to bestow, what kind of power would you like to have, what kind of influence would you like to have. I'm asking you to go home and work on the why. Spend some time as you fly over the clouds and over the ocean, back to where you came from. I'm asking you to have a vision by the time you've reached home. Apply. Why you want this kind of income? Why you want this kind of recognition and these kinds of skills? I'm asking you to develop your own list of why. Now here's number two. The first question to ponder when you go home is why. Here's another good answer to why. It's the second question. Why not? Why not see how much you can earn? Why not see how much you can learn? Why not see how many skills you can develop? Why not see what kind of person you can become? Why not see what kind of influence you can have? Why not see how many people you can rescue from oblivion? Why not see how many people you can reach? I want you to establish some of your goals. I want you to give thoughtful consideration to your goal. And why not? We got good health for many, why not the rest? What's happened for you, why not others? And why not you? I want you to take that personal. Why not? Why not? You've got to stay here till you go. And what else are you going to do? Why not see how much you can do, how far you can go? Now here's number three. Why not you? I wish I could say that to each of you individually. But it would take a couple of lifetimes to sit down and talk with each of you individually. But I would rather do that. I'd love to spend a couple of days with each of you personally and pour out my heart, my soul, what's going on in my head, what's going on with me, see if we couldn't connect and find something valuable. But time doesn't permit for us to have those intimate conversations, get to know each other that well, so I've got to do it from up here. But I want you to take it personally. And my personal question to you is why? Uh, yeah. You've got the brains, you can make decisions, you can study the plan, you can change your life, you can grow immensely in the next few years, you can make your dreams come true, you can build a financial wall around your family, nothing can get through, you can become healthy, you can become powerful, why not you? And now here's my last question. My very last question. On the questions to ponder is why not now? A good time. As the 20th century starts to wind down, a few more years, it's ready for 21. What a good time. Set your goals, work on yourself, work on your... What a good time. Get it together. What a good time to start this process. Personal development, growing, changing, developing. Having a good plan for your money and for your life and your future. Why not now? I hope I haven't shared days and share with you the experience, the reaction, the response you might have had on Monday. Until I get a chance to see you on this side of the world or the other side, some school or some seminar, or maybe I'll come and speak for a company. Hope I get a chance. Until then, I wish you the best. I want all that I've gotten to be yours and God bless. Everything you are, or ever will be, is up to you. You are the master of your own fate, architect of your own destiny. You are self-made, completely responsible for the quality of your life and for your results. The principle of self-development is one of the vital keys to the psychology of success. Self-development requires self-discipline, hard work, and persistence. It builds character, ability, and self-esteem. The more you work on yourself, the more you like and respect and believe in yourself, the more self-confidence you have, the greater the feeling of personal fulfillment you experience. Men and women who accomplish great things with their lives are not necessarily better or smarter or more gifted than others. They are usually just individuals who have made the efforts necessary to develop their potential to a greater degree than the ordinary. The wonderful thing about our free societies is that you could become just about anything you really want if you are willing to pay the price in terms of hard work on yourself.
There's no limit to how far you can go, except for the limits you place on yourself. I once read a quote from Abraham Lincoln that had a profound effect on my life. It was written in his diary as a young man in Springfield. It said, I will study and prepare myself, and someday my chance will come. I will study and prepare myself, and someday my chance will come. If you study and prepare yourself, your chance will come too. You will meet people unexpectedly who will enable you to utilize your knowledge. You will get phone calls and letters in the mail. You will come across articles and advertisements that lead you to use your skills and abilities. One of the most important of the mental laws is the law of correspondence, which says, as within, so without. Your outer circumstances in every area will correspond with your inner world. Your material financial world will reflect the quality and quantity of preparation you have engaged in. Every effort, small or large, accumulates and grows like a snowball rolling down a hill. Every act of delayed gratification, discipline, and self-development counts for something. Every extraordinary accomplishment is preceded by thousands of hours of ordinary preparation. Just as a spring becomes a trickle, a trickle becomes a brook. Brooks create streams and finally many streams create an enormous river that flows inexorably, unstoppably, carrying everything before it to the sea. So it is the self-development. Every achievement that is recognized and applauded is preceded by countless small efforts, failures, disappointments, and setbacks that no one ever sees. You can learn whatever you need to be successful. There is more information available today to help you to be more effective than has ever before existed. The smartest and most successful men and women who ever lived have poured the best of everything they know into books, tapes, seminars, and video -cas. Some of the most valuable information on succeeding in any field is available to you in exchange for a few dollars. Some hard, hard work. Would you like to double your income? How about increasing your income ten times, a thousand percent? Would you like that? If I can show you a simple formula that is virtually guaranteed to work, to double, triple, quadruple your income. Would you try it? Most people will say yes, but only about 1 in 20, according to my experience, will actually do it. There it is. Simple formula. The first, a simple question. Do you believe it is possible for you to increase your effectiveness and improve your productivity by 2% over the next month, the next 30 days? Let me put it this way. Could you do it if your life depended on it? Of course you could. One or two small changes in your daily routine, a little bit better time management, a little bit more effectiveness in your key result areas, could give you a 2% improvement. Now, having done it, first month, could you do it again the second month? 2% more. How about the third month? Could you, by working steadily on yourself, a little bit each day, managing your time a little better, improving your overall productivity, could you increase your performance and your effectiveness by 2%? In the third one, of course you could. Almost anyone could. They cared enough to apply themselves. You get onto a learning curve. Well, 2% per month, compounded, translates into 26% per year. 26% per year productivity improvement through personal development, skill enhancement, and additional training is a reasonable, believable, even modest but surely attainable goal. 26% per year compounded will equal 100% improvement in three years, 1,000% improvement in 10 years. This simple 2% formula can be the most important success formula you ever learn. Now here's how it works. You first of all, determine your aim. Do you really want to achieve great financial success in your work? Do you want it badly enough to pay the price in terms of preparation? Assuming the answer is yes, here's what you do. First of all, you stop or dramatically cut back on all those activities that do not contribute anything to your life. Then, become an avid reader. Reading is to the mind as exercise is to the body. Reading is vital to your success. Not only does it require total concentration, but you learn things by reading that you cannot learn any other way. There is no substitute for it. In fact, if you read just one book per month to develop or improve yourself in some way, it will put you in the top 1% in terms of personal development. If you read one book per week, which you can do if you read one hour per day, that will translate into 52 books per year, 520 books over 10 years. If you read 520 books to improve yourself and enhance your effectiveness at work, 
in a world where the average person reads less than one book per year, do you think it might give you the edge? The critical winning edge that makes all the difference between success and failure? You bet it would. One book per week would so change the course of your life in a positive way that you would be astonished. And it won't take 10 years. You'll begin to see significant changes in the quality of your life and your results within months, sometimes within weeks, sometimes within days. Well, you begin by getting up each morning, two hours, before your first appointment or before you have to be at work, earlier if necessary. Then, before you leave the house, we write your major goals in a brief description of your goals for the day. It's a few lines, takes you a couple of minutes to rewrite those goals and impress them into your mind. This exercise activates your subconscious and gives you a sense of purpose and focus for the hours ahead. Next, and this is very important, listen to educational audio cassettes during travel and talk, in your cars when if you use public transportation, or if you're flying. The average car owner drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles per year. This is as many as 500 to 1,000 hours per year in the car. This translates into 12 and a half to 25 40 hour weeks sitting in the car behind the wheel enjoying prime learning time. This is the equivalent of one to two university semesters. You can become one of the best educated, most highly motivated, well informed people of our society simply by listening to audio cassettes in your car. If you're not listening to audio cassettes in your car continually, you're missing hundreds of hours of prime learning time and every hour you miss is going to cost you in lost earnings and diminished potential. The third leg of the triangle of self-development, first two are reading and listening to audio cassettes, is courses and seminars put on by people who have achieved success in the subjects they're talking about. And this is important. Attend at least four seminars or courses per year, one every three months. Take all the training you can get and never stop learning. If your company supplies you with training opportunities, take every single one of them. And if your company does not remember, you are totally 100% responsible for your ongoing education. The whole purpose of an education, even up to university level, is simply to teach you how to learn. From then on, it's up to you to apply the lessons. I think that the major difference between winners and losers is their attitude towards spending money on improving themselves. Winners recognize that they are their most precious asset. Winners are always investing in improving the quality of their thinking and the quality of their knowledge. They recognize the functioning of their mind more than anything else is going to determine everything that happens to them and they're always working in achieving a higher level of mental fitness and mental preparedness. Remember, they say that luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. Winners in almost every field are characterized by the fact that they know more, that they have more practical knowledge acquired through study and experience than do the underachievers. It's as simple as that. Losers always make excuses for not investing in themselves. You've probably all heard the things they say. They say things like, I can't afford it, which means, of course, that I won't afford it. They usually have money for clothes and money for socializing and money for liquor and money for travel, but they don't have money to invest in their own minds. They say, I don't have the time, which means, of course, that they won't make the time to invest in themselves. And the worst of all, they say, I don't need that because I know all that stuff already. Most losers fall into the category of what they call the unconscious incompetent. This is the person who does not know and does not know that he does not know the truly hopeless case. People with limited education are aware of how little they know relative to how much there is to learn, so they're continually seeking new information. University graduates often think that they've learned everything there is to know and they stop reading when they leave campus. The bottom line of the losing mentality is that the loser does not believe in himself or herself. The loser doesn't believe that any efforts in self-development would change anything, so they don't even try. Remember, a person who does not read is no better than a person who cannot read. A person who does not work on himself or herself is no better than a person who cannot. Ignorance is one of the greatest enemies of mankind, and today, in our wide-open society, ignorance is self-inflicted and inexcusable. Here are seven final thoughts on personal development. Number one. Begin right now, today, to become a perpetual learning machine. Read, study, listen to tapes, take courses continually. 
One hour per day study in any subject will make you an authority in three years, a national expert in five, and international authority in seven. Number two, remain teachable. Remain open, interested, curious. In all your life you will never learn all there is to know about even one subject, even about yourself, for instance. Number three, if you want to be successful, study success. Become an expert on success. Learn proven success methods from others so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Number four, get around other successful people. Why with eagles don't scratch with turkey? Learn from them. Ask their advice on what to do, what to read, what courses to take, what takes to listen to. And be willing to help others with advice on success as you learn it. Number five, the human being is an organism. And if you're not growing with the input of new information and ideas, you're stagnating. Most people are stuck in a rut because they stopped growing. Don't let this happen to you. If you stop taking in new information, your mind and your brain begin to atrophy. And you tend to fall into a state of lethargy and depression. It is new information that gets you out of it. Number six, as Jim Rohn says in the audio cassette program, Seven Secrets of Wealth and Happiness, work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your job. Work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your job. Remember, you are your most valuable asset. And finally, number seven, the self-respect and self-confidence that comes as a result of learning and growing toward the fulfillment of your potential is the root source of self-esteem and self-worth. The, the first trait of a pleasing personality always is a positive mental attitude because nobody wants to be around the person who's negative and no matter what other traits you may have if you don't have a positive mental attitude at least when you're in the presence of people you're not going to be considered to have a pleasing personality and the next one is on flexibility the ability to unbend and adjust yourself to the varying circumstances of life without going down under them you know there are a lot of people in this world who are so stuck in their habits and in their mental attitude that they cannot adjust to anything that's unpleasant or anything that they don't agree with. You know why Franklin D. Roosevelt was one of the best? Because he adjusted himself to their mental attitude and he didn't get mad at the same time. The elephant has learned to be flexible enough not to get mad when the other fellow is mad because there are so many things in this life that you have to adjust yourself to temporarily if you're going to have peace of mind and good health. It might as well start now. Learn to do it. If you're not flexible, you can become flexible. Number three, on the pleasing tone of voice. A lot of people have harsh tones. They talk, does not have personal magnetism. They do not know how to give a pleasing tone to his voice. And he'll never get his audience in a million years if you try. You've got to learn to, if you're going to teach, if you're going to lecture, if you're going to, into public speaking, or even in good conversation, if you can't do that now, you can do it with a little bit of practice, oftentimes by simply lowering your voice, not talking too loudly. I don't think that anybody can teach another person how to make each tone of voice pleasing. I think you have to do that yourself. You have to do it by experimenting, but first of all, before you do it, you have to feel pleased. How could you use a pleasant tone of voice when you felt angry, for instance? You can, but it's not too effective unless you really feel inside of you the way you're expressing yourself. All those are things. They're carefully studied techniques that you have to acquire. I don't know of anything that will pay off better than to be pleasing in the eyes of other people. It's just one of those things that, that you can't get along without. You know, a lot of people don't understand the full meaning of tolerance. That means an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. You'd be surprised at how few people there are in this world with open minds. Have a playlist into pleasing mental attitudes. You've got to have an open mind because the very minute people find that you have prejudices that involve them, any of these things that affect them, they're going to back away from you. Do you have any idea why it is that I can have all of the religious followers of all religions in my classes and get along well with all of them? 
uh, to me, they're, they're my fellow beings or my brothers and sisters. I never thought I think of anybody in terms of what he believes politically or religiously or economically. If you have a closed mind, you'll find that you'll miss out on a lot of information, a lot of facts that you need. That means you've ceased to grow. Um, a keen sense of humor. If you don't have it, you have to cultivate it so that you can adjust yourself to all of these unpleasant things. One of the finest tonics that you can take is to have a good laugh at least several times a day. If you don't have anything to laugh at, look at yourself in the glass. You'll always get a laugh out of that. Surprised you out of your mind right while you're doing it. If you've got troubles, they'll melt away. And they won't seem near as big when you're laughing as when you're crying. Next, the frankness of manner and speech. Discriminate control of the tongue at all times based upon the habit of thinking before you speak. Now, most people don't do that. They speak first and think or regret afterward because if you just before you utter any kind of an expression to anybody to figure out whether it's going to benefit the person that's listening or damage it. Well, it's going to benefit you or damage you. Number seven, pleasing facial expression. No, it's a marvelous thing to learn to smile when you're talking to people. You'll be surprised at how much more effective what you say is when you're smiling and then when you're frowning or when you're looking serious. That makes a tremendous difference on the person that's listening. You don't have to be pretty, you don't have to be handsome, but a smile will decorate you and be embellishing no matter who you are, making your facial expression much more beautiful. And then a keen sense of justice, being just with another person even when it's to your disadvantage to do so. What a wonderful thing that is and how that does endear you to other people. Do you have any idea how many people there are that are just fair and just and honest only when they, they know it's going to come back to them in one way or another? How quickly they'd be dishonest if it is profitable to them to do it. And then excellent sincerity of purpose. Nobody likes a person who is obviously insincere in what he says and does. Do you think a person who doesn't know anything except about one thing and you'll find a person that that becomes tiresome the moment he gets out of that sphere. Tactfulness in your speech and in your attitude toward other people. You'd be surprised how much you can do with people if you're just tactful with them. Oftentimes, instead of telling people to do things or asking them to do things, it might be very tactful and helpful if you requested them uh, and asked them if they would mind doing things, even though you're an authority to give them an instruction. One of the most outstanding employers I ever knew, like Andrew Carnegie, he always asked his associates and his employees if they would mind doing something for him or if it would be convenient or suitable. No wonder he got along so well with people. No wonder he was so successful. And then the promptness of decisions that you've made. Render snap judgments. Number 13, faith in infinite intelligence. You would be surprised how many people there are to give lip service to this question of faith in the infinite intelligence and don't do very much about it outside of a lip service. They don't indulge in very outstanding acts backing up their alleged belief in infinite intelligence. I don't know how the uh, creator feels about it, but I believe that one act is worth a million tons of good intentions. Probably just one act. Number 14, appropriateness of words. I never saw an age when people indulged in slang statements, double talk and all that sort of thing as now. And it may seem smart to the fellow who's doing it, but it's not smart for the fellow who's listening. Then the, uh, the controlled enthusiasm. Uh, turn on his enthusiasm at the right time, the right amount, and then turn it off at the right time is, is going to be considered to have a pleasing personality. And incidentally, if you're not able to, to exude enthusiasm when you want to, you certainly are not going to be considered a pleasing personality because there are times when you definitely need it. Almost anything that you're doing in human relationships requires a certain amount of enthusiasm at times. And enthusiasm is one of those things you can cultivate. It's just like all these other qualities. Control enthusiasm. You're not going to win all the time in life. Nobody can do that. There are going to be times when you lose. When you lose, lose gracefully and graciously, and then don't take it too seriously, no matter what it is. You know, during the Depression, I had four of my friends. I lost twice as much as they did, and I, I didn't jump off a building. I didn't shoot myself. I didn't poison myself. And I said to myself, well, darn it, all over again, wherever I get a bunch of people together to listen, I'll be able to start making money. You can. How are you going to down a person with that kind of an attitude? No matter how many times he defeats, he's come right up again just like a cork. You can put him down in the water, but he could bounce up the moment. If you don't take it, you'll make it. Number seven, in common courtesy. 
What a wonderful thing it is to be courteous to the person to whom you don't have to be courteous. I've always thought that anybody that would abuse another person in public and with or without a cause had something wrong with his machinery and then something is missing in life and uh, the appropriateness of personal adornment. Uh, that's important to anybody in public life. You, ordinarily, the best dressed person is the one that's dressed so that if you were told to describe how he or she would dress later on, you couldn't do it. You'd say, well, I know it was, he looked nice, or she looked nice. Then good showmanship, you've got to be able to be a good showman. Know when to dramatize words, when to dramatize circumstances. You know, there are certain things, if you describe them in just ordinary language and didn't dramatize them as you went along, well, you'd fall down flat. You've got to learn the art of showmanship as you go along, and it's something you can learn. Then on temperance and eating, drinking, working, playing and thinking. Do yourself just as much damage with ease as you can with drinking liquor, just as much. I don't allow anything to take charge of me, not too much, not too little. Temperance, temperance. It's a marvelous thing. There's nothing so very bad in it. Don't you know, if you don't overdo it, then patience under all circumstances, you learn to time these things so that you get action out of other people at the time once more, when the time is more favorable. But if you don't have patience, you try to force the hand of other people. You'll get to know where you get it turned out or a knockdown when you don't want it. You require patience in order that you may time your relationships with people. And you have to have a lot of patience. You have to be able to control yourself at all times. Number 23, gracefulness and posture and carriage of the body. If I came in like this, of course, I'd be very comfortable. That's much easier. But it's finer. I mean, stand up like this. Look like I can stand straight without leaning on anything. Slump around and be careless in your posture. Marchi is one who is not too particular about his own personal appearance and so forth. It's, it's a good idea to have gracefulness in posture and carriage of the body. Then uh, uh, the humility of the heart. I don't know of anything as wonderful as to, uh, to have true humility of the heart. Try to maintain that sense of humility in my heart. Regardless of what happens to me that's unpleasant, regardless of how sick. The more successful I become, the more human I observe this feeling of humility of the heart. Recognizing that after all, whatever success I have is due entirely to the friendly, marvelous love and affection and cooperation of other people. Lastly, personal magnetism. That's an inborn trait and the only one of the traits of personality which cannot be cultivated, but it can be controlled and directed to beneficial usage. Convert that great created energy over into doing the thing that you want to do most of the time. Being in that word transmuting, something to conjure with, something to look up in the dictionary, make sure you understand what it means. You're going to find out that when you really come down to answering these questions and giving yourself uh, a rating that you have certain weaknesses that you didn't know you had. Let's find out about ourselves to see just where we stand, what it is that makes us tick, why people like us, why people dislike us. The development of character is the great business of life. Your ability to develop a reputation as a person of character and honor is the highest achievement of both social and business life. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear a word you say. The person you are today, your innermost character, is the sum total of all your choices and decisions in life up to this date. Each time you have chosen rightly and acted consistently with the very best that you know, you have strengthened your character and become a better person. The reverse is also true. Each time you have compromised, taken the easy way, or behaved in a manner inconsistent with what you knew to be right, you have weakened your character and softened your personality. The great virtues. There are a series of virtues or values that are usually possessed by a person of character. These are courage, compassion, generosity, temperance, persistence, and friendliness, among others. We'll talk about some of these in part three of this book. Coming before all these values, however, is the most important one of all when determining the depth and strength of your character. Integrity it is your level of integrity, living in complete truth with yourself and others, that demonstrates more than anything else the quality of your character. In a way, integrity is actually the value that guarantees all the other values. When your level of integrity is higher, you're more honest with yourself and more likely to live consistently with all the other values that you admire and respect. 
However, it takes tremendous self-discipline to become a person of character. It takes considerable willpower to always do the right thing in every situation. And it takes both self-discipline and willpower to resist the temptation to cut corners, to take the easy way, or to act for short-term advantage. All of life is a test to see what you are really made of deep down inside. Wisdom can be developed in private through study and reflection, but character can only be developed in the give and take of daily life when you're forced to choose and decide among alternatives and temptations. The test of character. It is only when you are under pressure, when you are forced to choose one way or another to either live consistently with a value or to compromise it that you demonstrate your true character. Emerson also said, guard your integrity as a sacred thing. Nothing at last is sacred except the integrity of your own mind. You are a choosing organism. You are constantly making choices one way or the other. Every choice you make is a statement about your true values and priorities. At each moment you choose what is more important or of higher value to you over what is less important or a, of lesser value. The only bulwark against temptation, the path of least resistance and the expediency factor is character. The only way you can develop your full character is by exerting your willpower in every situation. Now, when you're tempted to do what is easy and expedient rather than what is correct and necessary, becoming a person of character for exercising your willpower and self-discipline to live consistently with the very best that you know is tremendous. When you choose the higher value over the lower, the more difficult over the easy, the right over the wrong, you feel good about yourself. Your self-esteem increases. You like and respect yourself more. You have a greater sense of personal pride. In addition to feeling excellent about yourself when you behave with character, you also earn the respect and esteem of all the people around you. They will look up to you and admire you. Doors will be open for you. People will help you. You'll be paid more, promoted faster, and given yet even greater responsibilities. As you become a person of honor and character, opportunities will appear all around you. On the other hand, you can have all the intelligence, talent, and ability in the world, but if people do not trust you, you will never get ahead. People will not hire you, and if they do, they will dehire you as soon as possible. Financial institutions will not lend you money because birds of a feather flock together. The only associates, never friends, you will ever have will be other people of questionable character. Furthermore, since the people you associate with have a major effect on your attitude and personality, you make or break your entire life with the quality of your character or the lack thereof. The development of character, Aristotle wrote, all advancement in society begins with the development of the character of the young. This means that advancement in your life begins with the learning and practice of values. You learn values in one or all of three ways of instruction study and practice. Let's look at each of these more closely. Teach your children values. One of the chief roles of parenting is to teach children values. This requires patient instruction and explaining the values to them over and over again as they are growing up. Once is never enough. The value and the importance of living by that value must be explained. Parents must not only give illustrations but also contrast the adherence to a value especially that of telling the truth with its opposite, that of lying or telling half-truths. Children are very susceptible to the lessons they receive from the important people in their lives. As they're growing up, they accept what you say as their parent as a fact, as absolute truth. They absorb what you say like a sponge. You write your description of values on their souls, which are like wet clay, so that what you write becomes a permanent part of the way they see the world and relate to life. More than anything else, as we'll see in chapter 19, you demonstrate your values and your behavior. Your children will watch you and strive to emulate the values that you not only teach and preach, but also practice. And they are always watching. The Rockefeller family children were famous for being taught financial values at an early age. Even though their father was one of the richest men in America, the children were given tasks and chores to perform before they received their allowances. They were then instructed on how to spend their allowances, how to save, how much to give to charity, and how much to invest. As a result, they grew up to become successful businessmen and statesmen. Unlike children who had grown up in wealthy homes, 
We're seldom disciplined in money matter. Study the values you admire. You learn values by studying them closely. The law of concentration says that whatever you dwell upon grows and increases in your life. Uh, what this means is that when you study and read stories about men and women who uh, demonstrated the kind of values that you admire and respect, and then think about those stories and that behavior, those values sink ever deeper into your mind. Once these values are programmed into your subconscious, they create a propensity within you to behave consistently with those values when the situation requires them. For example, in military training, soldiers are continually told stories of courage, obedience, discipline, and the importance of supporting their fellow soldiers. The more they hear these stories, discuss them, and think about them, the more likely they are to behave consistently with these values when they're under the pressure of actual combat. The core value or virtue of character is truth. Whenever you tell the truth, however inconvenient it may be at the time, you feel better about yourself and you earn the respect of the people around you. One of the highest accolades you can pay another person is to say that he or she always tells the truth. Emulate the people you most admire. Much of your character is determined by the people you most admire, both living and dead. Who are they? Looking over your life and history, make a list of the people whom you most admire. And next to their names, write out the virtues or values that they most represent to you. If you could spend an afternoon with anyone living or dead, what one person would you choose? Why would you choose that person? What would you talk about during your afternoon together? What questions would you ask and what would you want to learn? Consider this as well. Why would that person want to spend an afternoon with you? What are the virtues and values that you have developed that make you a valuable and interesting person? What makes you special? Practice the values you respect. You develop values by practicing them whenever they are called for. As the Roman Stoic philosopher Epictetus said, circumstances do not make the man. They merely reveal him to himself. When a problem occurs, people tend to react automatically based on the highest values that they have developed. Up to that moment, we develop values by repetition, by behaving consistently with a particular value over and over again until it becomes a habit and locks in so that we come to practice it automatically. Men and women with highly developed characters behave in a manner consistent with their highest values and they do so without thought or hesitation. There's no question in their minds about whether or not they're doing the right thing. The structure of personality, the psychology of character involves the three parts of your personality. Your self-ideal, your self-image, and your self-esteem. Your self-ideal is that part of your mind composed of your values, virtues, ideals, goals, aspirations, and your idea of the very best person that you could possibly be. In other words, your self-ideal is composed of those values that you most admire in others and most aspire to possess in yourself. The most important part of your self-ideal is summarized in the word clarity. Superior people are those who are absolutely clear about who they are and what they believe. They have complete clarity about the values they believe in and what they stand for. They are not confused or indecisive. They are firm and resolute when it comes to any decision in which a value is involved. On the other hand, irresolute people are fuzzy and unclear about their values. They have only a vague notion of what is right or wrong in any situation. As a result, they take the path of least resistance and act expediently. They do whatever seems to be the fastest and easiest thing to get what they want in the short term, giving little or no consideration or concern about the consequences of their acts, the evolution of character. In biology, life forms are categorized from the least to the most complex, from single-celled plankton all the way up to the increasingly complex spectrum of life to the human being. Similarly, human beings can be organized along a spectrum as well, from the least to the most developed. The lowest forms of humans are those with no values, virtues, or character. These people always act expediently and take the path of least resistance in their search for immediate gratification. At the highest levels of development of the human race, however, are those men and women of complete integrity who would never compromise their honesty or their character for anything, including the threat of financial loss, pain, or even death. George Washington is famous for his honesty, which was demonstrated in the story in which he admitted that he had cut down the cherry tree. In the same vein, 
The founding fathers of the United States wrote that we hereby pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In his book, it still was trust. The social virtues and the creation of prosperity, philosopher Francis Fukuyama observed that societies worldwide can be divided into two kinds, high trust and low trust. He also argues that the highest trust societies, those in which integrity is most admired, encouraged and respected, are also the most law-abiding, free and prosperous. At the other end of the societal spectrum, however, are those societies characterized by tyranny, thievery, dishonesty, and corruption. Each of these is, without exception, both undemocratic and poor. Trust is the key. Trust is the lubricant of human relationships. Where there is high trust among people, economic activity flourishes, and there are opportunities for all. On the other hand, where there is a low trust, economic resources are squandered in an attempt to protect against thievery and corruption. Or those resources are not available at all. In the United States, we have the Constitution and Bill of Rights. These documents lay out the rules by which Americans agree to live. They create the structure of our government and guarantee our rights. But they assume that our elected representatives will be men and women of honor committed to protecting and defending those rights. They attempt to assure that only men and women of character can thrive and prosper over the long term in our economic, political, and social system. They aim to assure that in most cases, only men and women of character can rise um, to high positions in society. Although our system is not perfect and people of questionable character occasionally rise to positions of prominence, it has seldom lasted for very long. The basic demand of Americans for honesty and integrity eventually leads to the exposure and censure of dishonest people. The demand for men and women of character continues unabated. Your self-image. Your inner mirror, the second part of your personality, is your self-image. This is the way we see and think about ourselves, especially prior to any event of importance. People always tend to behave on the outside consistently with what they see themselves on the inside. This is often called our inner mirror into which we peer before we engage in any behavior. When you see yourself as calm, positive, truthful, and possessed of high character, you behave with greater strength and personal power. Other people respect you more, and you feel in control of yourself and the situation. What's more, whenever you actually behave in a manner that is consistent with your highest values, your self-image improves. You see and think about yourself in a better light, and you feel happier and more confident. Your behavior and outward performance then reflect this increasingly improving inner picture you have of yourself as the very best person you can possibly be. People tend to accept you at your own evaluation of yourself, at least initially. If you see and think of yourself as an excellent person who is possessed of high character, you will treat other people with courtesy, grace, and respect. In turn, they will likewise treat you as a person of honor and character. Your self-esteem. How much you like yourself, the third part of your personality, is your self-esteem. This is how you feel about yourself, your emotional core. Your self-esteem is defined as how much you like yourself, but it's more than only this. The more you see yourself as a valuable and important person, the more positive and optimistic you will be. When you truly consider yourself to be important and valuable, you will treat other people as if they are important as well. Your self-esteem is largely determined by how consistent your self-image, which shapes your personal behavior, is with your self-ideal or your vision of the very best person you can possibly be. Whenever you act consistently with who you consider an excellent person to be, your self-image improves and your self-esteem increases. You like and respect yourself more and you feel happy about yourself and others. The more you like yourself, the more you like others and the more they like you in return. By acting with character and in harmony with your highest values, you put your whole life internally and externally into an upward spiral. In every area of your life, things will get better and better for you. Your role models have a tremendous impact on shaping your character. The more you admire a person and his or her qualities, the more you strive, consciously and unconsciously, to become like that person. This is why clarity is so important. Always behave consistently. Whenever you act in a way that is consistent with your values, you feel good about yourself. Whenever you compromise your values for any reason, you feel bad about yourself. This also means that when you compromise your values, your self-confidence and self-esteem go down. 
You feel uneasy, inferior, inadequate, and uncomfortable. When you compromise your values deep down inside, you feel that something is fundamentally wrong. Almost all human problems can be solved by a return to your highest values and your innermost convictions. When you look back, there have probably been situations in your life when you have compromised your values in order to save an investment, keep a job, preserve a relationship, or maintain a friendship. In each case, uh, you have felt worse and worse until you finally broke it off and walked away. And how did you feel when you finally had the strength of character to walk away? You felt wonderful. Whenever you use your willpower and strength of character, to return to the values that are most dear to you, you are rewarded with a wonderful feeling of happiness and acceleration. You feel energized and free. You wonder why you didn't make that decision a long time ago. Now do the right thing. Uh, in the development of character that is based on self-discipline and willpower, long-term thinking is essential. The more you think about the long-term consequences of your behavior, the more likely it is that you will do the right thing in the short term. So when you have to make a choice or a decision, always ask the magic question, what's important here? Uh, I practice the universal maxim of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher. He said, resolve to behave as though your every act were to become a universal law for all people. One of the great questions for the development of character is this. What kind of a world would this world be if everyone in it were just like me? Whenever you sleep, whenever you do or say something, that is inconsistent with your highest values, immediately get back on your horse. Say to yourself, this is not like me, and resolve that next time you'll do better. What you dwell upon grows. If you are in a situation today in which you are not living up to your highest values, make a decision this very minute to confront the situation and straighten it out. The minute you do, you will once again feel happy and back in control. There's an old Indian story, on my shoulders are two wolves. One is a black wolf, evil, who continually tempts me to do and say the wrong things. On my other shoulder is a white wolf that continually encourages me to live up to my very best. A listener asked the old man, which of these wolves has the greatest power over you? The old man replied, the one I feed. By the law of concentration, whatever you dwell upon grows and increases in your life. When you think and talk, about the virtues and values that you most admire and respect. You therefore program those values deeper and deeper into your subconscious until they begin to operate automatically in every situation. Whenever you exercise your self-discipline and willpower to live your life consistently with those values that you most aspire to be known for, you begin to move rapidly along the path to becoming an excellent person.